Nations are founded on the zeal of its visionaries. Leaders of industry who build economic institutions from the ground up. A leader has to stand on his own. A leader has to have the capacity to suffer and sacrifice for his convictions. Leader is really uh, like your guide, philosopher, and in whom people have kind of a faith, trust, that he will take them to the, on the right path and to the right target. In the saga of Indian industry, few have had the sweeping influence of Colonel Satyapal Wahi. I personally think that there is something in a gene, in a man's gene to become a good leader and a good manager, which Wahi had. A champion of the public sector and a management renegade. He had a lot of guts where people hesitate to speak out or do something or say something, he will do if he believes that it is right. He was very upright and very uh, honest and man of integrity. He didn't fear people. And he didn't fear people only because he had nothing to fear. Through India's most critical growing years, he steered preeminent companies like BHEL, the Cement Corporation of India, and ONGC to record-breaking heights. This is the story of courage, conviction and character and the power of transformational leadership. India's growth story is incomplete without a chapter on its public sector stalwarts. These iconic captains of industry strove tirelessly through post-independence decades to put India on the path to progress. In doing so, they established a firm foundation for its 21st century economic boom. Destiny to me is equal to the genes plus the various actions you have taken at various stages of your life, taking into account the uncertain environment. Satyapal Wahi's journey of inspirational leadership began in pre-partition India. The youngest of eight children, he received an all too early lesson in the harsh realities of life. When he was eight years old, the family lost its patriarch and was compelled to move to Kushab in present-day Pakistan. Growing up in the rough trading town and grappling with the loss of a father, young Satyapal's life would have gone down a less than ordinary path, but for his mother, who proved to be his first role model of true leadership. My mother was a visionary and a true leader in every aspect. She gave us all the encouragement. She literally forced us to do certain rituals, which later on proved to be very effective, both as a manager, as a leader, but more importantly, as a good human being. This firm yet loving guidance was supplemented with the support of seven older siblings. It would be on a visit to one of their homes in Quetta that would be a turning point. Here, a chance encounter with an army contingent planted the seeds of military ambition. Some of those boys who were working in the army, they were from my hometown. So they used to come and bring some goodies from the canteen. And we used to chat with them. I was in a very impressionable age. And so that left an impression to be an engineer and also be an army man. To fulfill the first part of his aspiration, Satyapal Wahi enrolled in the engineering college at the Benares Hindu University, a training ground for India's future technocrats and leaders of industry. One thing which stood out clearly, and that is one of the points which endeared Wahi to me, is when there was a situation where you had to work hard to understand something, or achieve something, most of the people 
they were only interested in the result. How that result was achieved was a little less important. And they would take shortcuts. But this is one guy, he was never top of the class. But he said, no, I will slop till I understand. It was this dogged determination that saw him fulfill the second part of his dream of being an engineer in uniform. Upon graduating from the Benares Hindu University, he joined the Indian Military Academy in 1950. Both uh, Bahi and uh, his colleagues like me had been deeply affected by the training that we received at the Indian Military Academy. If you go to the Chetwood Hall of Indian Military Academy at Dehradun, you'll find it is inscribed on the wall that the honor, the safety of your country comes first, always and every time. Then comes the comfort and the welfare of your people you command and yourself always, every time, come last. Wahi uh, has very vivid memories which we, she shared with me of uh, the way he went into the field. I was posted at Baramola. I worked under a captain. He told me in his own lingo, look, from today, I stop working and you start working. All my powers are delegated to you. And he said, if you get into problem, please come back to me. So I took him literally and I went in the army as a helper ladder and struggled and pushed things left, right and made a few blunders in between. But whenever I went to him, he would always say, come on son, sit down, don't worry, I'll handle that. That was delegation. That was accountability. S.P. Wahi served in the Indian Army's Corps of Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, or EME, where he proved himself an enthusiastic and gifted engineer in uniform. It is also here that he first came into his own as an exemplary leader. I had heard of uh, uh, Colonel Wahi even earlier when he was a young captain. And quite interestingly, that even in his young days, he showed a very promising future. He was one of the most successful instructors in a training institution, imparting training to the young engineers as well as technicians. As commander of his EME battalion, Colonel Wahi was not one to lead from the sidelines. One night, he received word that a tank from his battalion had fallen off a bridge and needed to be extricated. Instead of delegating from behind a desk, the colonel decided to join his men in action. He personally reached the spot. Um, I didn't expect him. I thought he'd ask me to go there and uh, clear the tank. But when I reached there, I found it was a difficult task. I required somebody else to help me out and make out a plan. So I found Colonel Y himself was there. And he was there until I had put the shackles, put the layout, then how we are going to recover it, how we're going to drive it back onto the road. He was there. As commanding officer, S.P. Wahi not only rose up the military ranks, he also made his first foray into the Indian public sector. I was trained in the tank technology in UK. So when this heavy vehicles factory was being established, and the general manager was Mr. Mantosh Sonde, one of the most outstanding leaders I worked with. He had done his own research to find out who the people he should try to get for the heavy vehicles factory, and I was selected as one of those. Selection notwithstanding, the army wasn't ready to release Colonel Wahi to the Avadi Heavy Vehicles Factory. But neither was General Manager Mantosh Sondhi ready to let go of such dynamic potential. The EME were not ready to release Colonel Wahi. But uh, he negotiated, talked, spoke, whatever he could to get him. So obviously, 
uh, he was a very sought after person. Mantosh Sondi's insistence on enlisting Colonel Wahi was with good reason. His factory was building one of India's most prestigious projects, India's first indigenous tank, Vijayanta. He was my manager, shop floor in the tank manufacturing plant in Avadi, in Ministry of Defense. We were making the most important um, product, which is a military tank, for the first time in India. At an era when we didn't have decent automobiles being made, Kel Wahi always carried all of us. You cannot work in a, any situation without making some errors. He was a person who used to support you when he was correcting you and taking you forward. It was on the floor of the tank factory that Colonel Wahi displayed his trademark leadership quality, unflinching faith in the strengths and capabilities of his team. We had some foreign technicians who came to India to, as a collaborator to advise us on the manufacture of tanks in different departments. Some of them were really not even capable. It was people like Colonel Wahi who had the clear-cut thinking to request Mantosh Sondi, who was the general manager, saying that we don't need these people, they can be asked to go back. And they were sent back. This kind of determination, patriotism and the guts is something very highly appreciable. In 1965, India's first indigenous tank, Vijayanta, was rolled out it would go on to play a critical role in the Indo-Pak War of 1971. Colonel Wahi, meanwhile, returned to his EME battalion, where there were many more examples of leadership to set. See, Army is an institution which trains you and develops you to win wars, to win battles, and the strategies and tactics which they follow, they are extremely useful for the business itself. After a standout managerial debut at Avadi's tank factory, Colonel Wahi was summoned once again by his mentor, Mantosh Sondi, this time to Bukharo Steel. It was a stint that would cement his calling in the business world. Through it all, the teachings of legendary military strategist Sun Tzu stayed close to his heart. All the strategies and tactics are applicable, but they're all applicable to condition your mind, both for discipline, both for having a long-term vision, working out contingency plans, working out organization structures, which are giving you a collaborative approach. You win the battles and finally, you win the war. In 1972, Colonel Wahi took voluntary retirement from the Indian Army and became a permanent asset to Bukharo Steel. Then, in 1974, came an offer he couldn't refuse, to lead the construction of the Central Forge foundry plant of one of India's leading public sector companies, Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, or BHEL. The Central Forge Foundry Plant, or CFFP, in Haridwar was an ambitious project that had languished on paper until BHEL's Dr. V. Krishnamurti called on Colonel Wahi. Fortunately, Mr. V. Krishnamurti happened to be an outstanding uh, manager and we had full freedom to operate. And all initiatives were taken by the C CFP itself, that is myself and with my other colleagues. And we worked out our own strategy and our own tactics, how to build that plant in a world record time. We created a culture of building your own house that people who had to be the operational heads in that 
CFP they were made to act as construction managers. So the idea was how to remove conflicts once the plant goes into operation. So this strategy was tried there and it worked beautifully. The most important change he brought about was the synergy amongst the various disciplines. If I remember right, there were something like 50 different disciplines in the organization. Bringing them all together on a common platform, with a common purpose, with a common understanding of each other. That is the kind of an organization, transformational change he brought about in BHEL. He was on the shop floor every minute of the day he could spare. He was with them, part of them. And I must tell you, he can be very serene and composed in crisis situations. But otherwise, he's a very impatient and restless man to make sure that the objectives are met in record time. Our board in BHL was surprised. Our collaborators in France, Cruzulo, they were amazed how this factory, they came all the way to Hardwar to find whether we were bluffing them or it was actually commissioned. The project's spectacular success was testament to Colonel Wahi's people-friendly management mantras. They had helped BHEL evolve from an organization into a family. The best productivity happened out of off-floor activities, either by way of social get-togethers or by way of sports, cultural activities. All these things got a tremendous impetus. And in that regard, Mrs. Wahi was a tremendous pillar of support for him. Shobna Wahi transformed BHEL's Haridwar campus by organizing its ladies into a force for social good. Her impact was felt most strongly in education as she brought nationally renowned schools like DPS and Tiny Tots to the small town. Ranipur is a very small industrial town and keep ourselves busy, it's better to involve in good welfare, social activities so that you are helping the society, the poor people around, the villages around and gives you a tremendous amount of satisfaction. And my wife played a very major role in giving me feedback on what was hurting people and we were able to take corrective actions how to raise the morale and motivation. Sometimes she used to send her own personal car to bring the ladies when they needed some immediate help from the hospitals. Well, that is only if you are involved with the people and that is what you call really emotional interaction. Both Colonel and Mrs. Wahi helped create an organization that cared deeply for its people no matter how big or small their post. The other major transformational change he brought about was the relationship with the unions and the workers. He had a certain hierarchy whose job was to interact with the unions at various points, but he had his own direct approach to every level of the union. It was this close relationship that would stand Colonel Wahi in good stead through one of the most harrowing crises of his BHEL tenure. In 1978, a scuffle at the factory gates fanned the flames of simmering discord between BHEL's workers and members of the Central Industrial Security Force. The dispute reached ahead when a security guard was killed by angry mobs of workers. With no one ready to back down, the situation was explosive. It was a kind of a situation where the factory would have to be locked out for God knew how many days. But the finesse with which Colonel Wahi dealt with it was extraordinary. If we did not control the situation, that since a security man was killed, they would have killed many more. So the idea was how to get hold of the their arms and ammunition. So immediately I had to get their arms and ammunition lock up done immediately. Now, this was immediate action because if it was not taken, there would have been a mass murder there. 
we started a series of discussions with the union leaders and several people wanting to represent the workers' point of view. It was certainly an occasion for a blame game, but Colonel Wahi was not going to indulge in that game. His objective was very clear. The factory cannot be allowed to be locked out. He was appealing to the national identity of his people and what it would cost the nation if they stopped working. We had to play a very major role in touching on their emotions. It took us about till about four o'clock in the morning to convince them that it will be a disgrace for the name of the BHL Hardwar if the factory does not restart. Exactly at seven o'clock, the factory restarted. When I told George Fernandez on telephone, his first reaction was, Colonel, don't bluff me. I mean, these are the exact words he used. The media refused to believe that such a thing could happen. The civil authorities did not believe that such a thing could happen. The attendance on that day was near cent per cent, and the production on that day was a record not yet beaten. Your ability to be friendly, your ability to be fair, and more importantly, to be firm when the conditions of demands. People will love you if these three apps are properly exhibited to the people, because people watch you very, very carefully as a leader. The leadership can be defined or covered in seven C's. The first C is character, unimpeachable character. Only then you can inspire and influence people. Then comes your competence. But more importantly, you should have ability to mine the minds of the people. You should have the competence to create a culture. Then comes courage, courage to take decisions. Then comes your commitment, commitment to the organization, the commitment to the people, and more importantly, commitment to the people around you, within and outside the organization. You should have the courage to communicate with people genuinely the correct information. Next comes your ability to conceptualize so that you do not miss the woods for the trees. Conceptualization is very important because it gives you the vision for the future and it gives the road back to the people to work on. Through the 1970s, Colonel Wahi strengthened the Indian public sector by leading BHEL and then the Cement Corporation of India. Both tenures were periods of uncharted growth for the organizations. As a new decade unfurled, Colonel Wahi decided to go after a long-cherished dream to contribute to India's energy sector. When I got into the public sector, I looked around and I found that area of energy was most challenging because that was important for the growth of the economy. More importantly, oil was an area which called for a tremendous amount of leadership. And I thought that was an area where I could experiment and take a challenge. Colonel Wahi was inducted into the Oil and Natural Gas Commission, or ONGC, in 1981 initially as officer on special duty, and soon after as chairman. He was taking over a company that had acquired a solid technical foundation, thanks to the untiring efforts of his predecessors. Now its potential was ripe for the Wahi brand of transformational leadership. The next eight years would be heralded as its golden period. He had a technical background, of course, but he was not an uh, oil man, but he came here, he understood the oil industry very well and he did many things, he gave a large picture and he was a big thinker. He showed ONGC how to think big in, in all terms, not only in terms of oil production and exploration, but also in, in living in style. When Colonel Wahi joined, 
one of the main thing was that we were producing very little oil, something eight or nine million tons, put all uh, onshore and offshore. And during the colonel's time, it went up up to more than 30 million tons. The mandate for the public sector to build up the economy of the country as far as possible. And ONGC played a very great role in that. Till 1947, only oil which was discovered was in Assam. And one of those experts from abroad mentioned that if you find oil anywhere else in India, I'll eat my boot. We are looking for that man because we have found oil. ONGC has found oil in almost every part of our country. ONGC's meteoric rise under Colonel Wahi was not an overnight phenomenon. It would require a systemic and organizational restructure. I believed in management by wandering. That is how you get to know the people. You get to know the, what is the dreams of the people and what are their expectations and what are the areas of concern. I was able to mine the minds of the people. In other words, a mental sort analysis was done. My perception of the NGC people was they were all diamonds. Some of them were uncut, some were unpolished, but most of them were diamonds. It only took three months for Colonel Wahid to understand what the potential was available in the organization. He said, look my dear friends, if you and I are going to work together, we have to look far beyond ourselves. Why don't we make a 20-year perspective plan for ourselves? In oil exploration, no plan less than 20 years can be effective. Because oil exploration is input deterministic, output probabilistic. All initial work was done by ONGC through its long-term plan. We got hold of the whole government in one go at one place in ONGC. Where all people like President, Prime Minister, he was a member of Planning Commission, the Cabinet Secretary, all the secretaries in the various economic ministries, and anybody who met us in the government was brought into that one conference hall. That probably was the first time, maybe the last time, when secretaries of their kind assembled outside their own offices and came into the public sector, in this case ONGC, and listened to the chairman making a presentation of what he intends to do for the next 20 years for the ONGC. And his vision was, from this 10 million tons, we will achieve 100 million tons. In one day, we were able to get the total commitment of the government with ONGC. We created a love affair with the bureaucracy and the politicians. And that gave us dividends for eight years and three months. I was holding the chair. Colonel Wahi's deft handling of relationships also helped ONGC establish mutual cooperation with influential players in the oil sector. From international oil giants and government luminaries to popular leaders across party lines, all stepped forward to contribute to its 20-year plan. But real transformation would have to come from within ONGC itself. The organizational structure of the organization was divided into geographical boundaries as I would like to put it, that onshore is separate and offshore is separate. But, uh, well, okay, probably in an engineering organization it is possible. But in an organization, exploratory organization, it is not possible. We found there was a lot of divide between the onshore and offshore. The moment you looked at people from onshore, you looked at people offshore, you could even see from their dresses that there were very two distinct cultures going on. There was no sharing of information between the two sides. So what Colonel Wahi did is he dismantled that sort of a structure. So he developed uh, the business group concepts. The geographical backgrounds were, uh, the geographical divisions rather, were broken altogether. And that gave a very good dividend 
we brought in a concept that everyone in the board or as we call it in the commission should not only be responsible for one function but should also be responsible for one region accountable for that region even member finance and member personnel were accountable for one region each it brought about an automatic call it collaborative approach between the six members cuz each one had to go to the other fellow to get help cuz six functions were involved in every region with the result the chairman became disposable they never came to chairman it was their pride not to bring any issues to the chairman for bringing about any change change was being done automatically at the level of the members one of the most significant changes colonel wahi brought to the organization was his thrust on oil exploration and production for oil production of course it takes time to develop your infrastructure but unless you have a very accelerated rate of drilling because ultimately the oil is found unless you drill it it is underground you will not find it so during colonel wahi's time uh, the rich population increased tremendously we knew that the future depends on the exploration activities in terms of drilling what we found at that time on land we had about 38 rigs out of which half of them were lying idle either they were out of date or they were under repairs whereas our assessment was that we need more than 140 rigs we made sure that indigenous development got the biggest boost during colonel wahi's tenure oil exploration drilling and production scaled new heights and ventured into new territories research and development of indigenous technologies were foremost on the chairman's to-do list this meant empowering ongc's technological think tank at the kd malvia institute of petroleum exploration see successes are very easy or maybe it can be termed that we are exploring the virgin basins but sustaining these successes sustaining production sustaining it requires technology and thought process that is where the roles of these institutes came in so he emphasized on this institutes playing a stellar role in creating our own r&d base so that we could have our field oriented solutions for these discoveries ever the technocrat Colonel Wahi had the foresight to anticipate the technology of the future. This vision led to the establishment of the Geodata Processing and Interpretation Center, the Institute of Engineering and Ocean Technology, the Institute of Oil and Gas Production Technology, and the Institute of Petroleum Safety, Health and Environment Management. Today, These institutes are amongst some of the best in the world, but their dividends had started coming in during Colonel Wahi's tenure itself. Uh, we had major discoveries, exploration successes. We had uh, Kaveri Basin was one of the main uh, basins which was put on the oil map, Kovil Kalapam. Rava in Krishna Godavari in East Coast became a reality. probably when he joined there were only about 30 or 34 rigs in the onshore area but by the time he left it had 104 rigs similarly in offshore i think when he joined it was probably seven platforms or something like this and by the time he left it was 34 now naturally this increase in the uh, drilling rigs in the onshore and offshore both will have their impact in getting more oil or in the discovery of more oil and it was during this time that one of the very big field after ankleshwar on the onland 
this uh, Gandhar field was discovered. Perhaps one of the most distinctive management strategies Colonel Wahi introduced was in establishing the critical flow of information across all rungs of ONGC. We created management services groups with each region and each member and the chairman. And that group was all the time interacting to find out what was happening. Most of the powers had been delegated, but chairman normally came into picture only when there was a crisis. In July 1982, crisis did come calling. Colonel Wahi, who had barely taken over the reins of ONGC, received an urgent call. It was the oil sector's worst nightmare. A catastrophic blowout had occurred on the Sagar Vikas rig of Bombay High, threatening the very existence of ONGC's flagship oil rig. He was in uh, Delhi. He got the information in the morning, and probably without brushing or anything, he rushed to the airport and landed in Bombay. He took a helicopter and went to a near about uh, drilling rig. So people were thinking, all those the senior people, ke, he will ask immediately a question, what happened? What have you done? Uh, what are the preparations? He didn't do all that. He said, ke, come on, let's have a cup of coffee. What was in the back of my mind was that if I now shout at them because they were expecting from an army fellow that will first ask them, what the hell have you done? But no questions were asked. I knew that they would be demoralized. They were already demoralized by the action which had taken place. The very fact they were there on the deck itself showed their concern, their own commitment. The main driller who was there on the Sagar Vikas, that poor fellow was evacuated and naturally he was uh, awake for the whole night and things like this. So he was sleeping in the bunkhouse. Colonel Wai asked him, where is he? People told him that he's in the bunkhouse and they offered that we'll call him. He said, no, 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 don't call him. I will go myself there. The moment I went to the bunkhouse to see Mr. Manmohan Singh, he jumped. Bhut has come, ghost has come. So I said, look, son, I've come to only see you that you're not hurt, that's all. Lie down, nothing will happen to you. Came back. And then he asked these boys, I said, now what is the problem and how is it to be handled? Colonel Wahi made a series of tough decisions in quick succession. He devised a daredevil helicopter operation to shut down the rig's generators. He also created a task force of experts from ONGC and called on the American firefighting consultancy, Red Adair. As they set about containing the blowout, Colonel Wahi turned his attention to informing the nation. One of the great things what Colonel Wahi did was uh, an open door policy for the media. Every evening or every day probably, they used to have a sort of a press conference where they used to tell the media that what has happened and what they are going to do for that. Because after all, it is a national. It was a national property. It was not a property only of ONGC. Nation had a right to know what is happening. We met the media people at Bombay. Told them, look, whatever information you need will be given to you personally by me. But I want one commitment from you: that you will not publish anything without checking back. They all raised their hand and they said, we are with you. It took three and a half days to tame the blowout and resulting fires. When the worst seemed over, experts from ONGC and Red Adair made a critical assessment, relight the fires of Sagar Vikas with immediate effect. However, Colonel Wahi's instinct would not agree. That is the only day I did not sleep because we had overruled the best experts when my own man who was next to me and who was considered to be a very brilliant officer also was with the consultants. Next morning we flew at five o'clock in the morning and we went. He literally stood up in the helicopter, took his hat off and put it on my laps. Colonel, you are right, we were wrong. You have saved how many thousand million dollars for your country? 
The Sagar Vikas blowout was a huge setback for ONGC in many respects. Yet, Colonel Wahi's leadership had ensured it would be remembered as an enduring example of ONGC's collective courage. We only got praise, though it was such a loss to the organization and to the country, crores of rupees. But uh, it is very remarkable that uh, not only media, the parliament came to our uh, rescue and parliament congratulated us that you are doing a very good job. He glamorized this and used it uh, to popularize and to educate the public of the risk of an offshore oil exploration activity. He had the entire country wishing along with him for an early mitigation of the problem. So it's a classic case of a turnaround of a crisis which could have been criticized into a situation where there was empathy generated all across and there was support all across. Throughout his military and corporate career, Colonel Wahi's strategy for success centered on one abiding principle, genuine love and affection for the people of the organization. He had a very soft corner for his employees. I remember a time um, when, there was a, when there were a number of cases um, filed against ONGC by the employees of ONGC, particularly in the Gujarat region, over small matters of promotion and gratuities and benefits. So he must have been reviewing those cases. So he once uh, uh, called me and said, I see a large number of our employees filing cases against ONGC. I don't want that. We pay so much tax to the government of India. We make so much profit. I'd rather that I share that profit with my employees because it is they who make it work. So in small matters, uh, Ashwini ji, uh, try not to fight the employees. Let us settle for the matter in their favor, wherever we can do so within the rules. So that was the man. He believed that uh, the people are the greatest assets. And uh, this is what, something which we hear today from every management conference. But he believed in it much earlier. He trusted his people and he encouraged the people and gave them benefits which were those days unheard of in the public sector space. And this gave a sense of confidence and pride and prestige to the employees who did their level best to match the image of the company. And that's the golden time or the golden period of the company where ONGC did exceedingly very well. This golden period was not restricted to the workplace alone. Colonel Wahi strategically built team spirit through sports and activities like mountaineering. It was a strength he would go on to fully exercise as president of the Indian Golf Union and the Public Sector Sports Control Board. He also served as chairman of the Sports Improvement Development Commission of the Indian Olympic Association. This multifaceted brand of leadership had a lasting influence, not just on ONGC, but also on Dehradun itself. After they came into the ONGC, they were a larger than life uh, couple. And uh, Dehradun is a very small town and ONGC is a big part of that small town. A big part of this presence was Shobna Wahi, the first chairman's wife to take up residence in Dehradun. Her arrival at the headquarters infused new vitality in the ONGC family. When I came here, naturally it had an impact on the people around. And then I told my husband that I must do something, otherwise, you know, it's a waste of time. A few months have passed and I want to start Ladies Club. I went to other localities like in Kolagara, colonies there. So I went and met the ladies. In town I went and met the ladies. And I pulled them out of their houses and we started the club. The beginning was with sewing classes, knitting classes, small things like that. And then as step by step she grew. Mrs. Wahi spearheaded the formation of ONGC's welfare center, vocational center and Shishu Vihar. leadership qualities basically to carry the people with you so that together you you are able to achieve your goals 
whether it's an organization or a ladies club when mrs indira gandhi came in 81 so we organized the whole program she was very impressed she appreciated what we had done and she said those days the slogan was garibi hata we were inspired by that with her leadership the mahila samiti also adopted nearby villages bringing education health and other critical services to local communities their motto of sangha shakti spread fast with members from other ongc regions joining in she always motivated people to know not only your equals but the people who are working for you also the wives should be included in everything the ladies played a very major role in maintaining a sense of community and looking after the religious feelings of people of the states and created um, many uh, other activities like dramas and fairs and things like that so they kept everybody busy as with previous organizations under mrs wahi the cultural ethos of ongc came alive the ladies had a sense of purpose and a creative outlet she also infused the ongc family with spirituality that encompassed all religions it was during her stay at deradun that the township welcomed mother teresa a visit that remains a landmark in ongc's history then came shobna wahi's most ambitious project the ongc mahila samiti polytechnic for women passionate about empowering women mrs wahi launched a spirited campaign to garner ongc and colonel wahi's support i then requested him i said please can you ask them to give us the the ladies club the building so he says what do you want it for i said i want to start a polytechnic for women he says are you crazy you don't have any idea and you suppose it doesn't uh, you know flourish the way you want i said i'll take a challenge and i want to start it and i want to take this project not only did mrs wahi take on the challenge she transformed it into one of ongc's most enduring csr successes today the ongc polytechnic has changed the lives of countless girls from all over the country and beyond. I need to be eternally grateful to her for where I am today because uh, at a time when there weren't too many options in Dehradun. I come from a conservative family so my father wasn't very keen on me going to Delhi or going to Bombay. And at that time when I finished with school suddenly there was this ongc mahila samiti polytechnic and suddenly for deradun the boys didn't have options but the girls suddenly had a lot of options so the polytechnic filled in a long uh, awaited need i think at that time and uh, it really fulfilled its function and we had girls coming in not only from deradun but all around the places say hills of uttarakhand up and uh, punjab haryana and uh, in fact during my time there was a girl from andamans also and one from dubai also my wife was a selfless worker and she sacrificed quite a bit in fact a lot to create that uh, feeling of family in the ongc i have seen her perform functions um, and organize functions on behalf of the ONGC's wives association and she did it with so much grace and elegance she was and remains a source of great strength to Colonel Wahi By the time Colonel Wahi retired from service in 1989 ONGC was a force to be reckoned with 
not just in the national, but international energy arena. We saw to it that uh, the, our production uh, goes up as far as possible. And it had a four or five fold increase. I mean, if you look at the curve, how the oil production has gone up during the Colonel Wahi's time, it is something like the Eiffel Tower, the slope. <laughs> he always stood by his people, and he passionately believed in the relevance and need for public sector. At a time when people were pressurizing um, all around to somehow dilute the importance of public sector, he stood his ground. He gave lot many things to the organization, to the people, because I mean, all this man, material, machine. Man is the most most difficult this thing. If you can win the man, you can you can I think surmount the the machine and the material. And he did that. He did that in a style. When the time had come for him to retire, he retired with great grace, and that is how it should be. The ability of a person to walk away from power and office with grace is a sign of great character. After decades of selfless service to the nation, today Colonel Wahi has entered a new phase. It is one of reflection and continued growth. Learning has remained as part of my life. Even today I learn. I'm learning from all the people I meet. And I'm sure I'll continue to learn. There's so much to learn. A life of learning has been rewarded by honorary doctorates from his alma mater Benares Hindu University, Rurki University and Dhanbad University. A career of distinction has earned him top honours of the Padma Bhushan and the Petrotech Lifetime Achievement Award. Crediting these awards to those he has led over the years, Colonel Wahi is motivated to nurture leaders of the future. Today, he continues to contribute his vast knowledge to the public and private sector as a management consultant. He has also authored a definitive autobiography, Leading from the Front. Having been chairman of ONGC, I don't want to subordinate myself to any other power. But I did want to share my experience, so that's why I formed a consultancy organization. I thought it is my duty to give little expertise which I picked up to the people who came to me, sometimes totally free of cost. I'm still happy. And uh, neither I'm needy nor greedy. History abounds with examples of transformational leaders, men and women who have altered the fates of entire nations and organizations. Colonel Satyapal Wahi has played an invaluable part in scripting the destiny of India. And in doing so, he has fulfilled his own remarkable destiny. In the childhood, I heard this beautiful couplet, Khudi ko karbulanditna. कि हर तकदीर से पहले खुदा बंदे से पूछे कि अब तेरी रजा क्या है